friends and um, welcome to the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Um, this evening we are hosting um, friend and colleague um, Akash Singh Rathor, um, who has brought his um, newly published um, biography, part one of a two-part biography of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Um, this is volume one, um, which is titled Becoming Baba Sahib, birth to Mahar 1891 to 1929. Um, I'm sure many people are familiar with Akash and his work. Um, he's uh, worked mostly on um, a combination of areas that also interest me very much, which is why I always try to keep track, although he's very, very productive and it's very hard to follow um, uh, follow along as he publishes um, uh, very often um, and more and more interesting work. But the two main areas that he has uh, been working on are um, the life ideas, uh, works and um, uh, intellectual and, 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 and sort of personal history um, of uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar um, and more broadly um, political thought, the history of political thought, um, especially in our part of the world. Um, and so that's, um, you know, a, an excellent uh, sort of convergence of interest, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, Akash is um, <clears throat> widely traveled and has uh, held numerous teaching and research positions um, all over India and all over the world. Um, and he's currently based in Southeast Asia. Um, but he is around in India, um, has been for the last couple of weeks and probably will be for a few more days at least, um, traveling with this uh, with this new volume. Um, Akash, it's great to have you at the center. Um, I don't want to sort of take more time, um, but we'll let you speak for as long as you wish, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, um, and oh, then... English. And <laughs> uh, and then I'm sure there'll be questions uh, from the audience, and there might be some as well from uh, from people who are who are who have joined us online. So um, please, the life and times of Bhim Rao Ramji Ambedkar. Thank you very much, Ananya, and thank you to this institution, CSDS, for for having me, uh, and to all of you for for coming. I recognize that when you come to one thing you're giving up going to something else so uh i always appreciate uh appreciate that uh i was particularly eager to come to csds uh rather for personal reasons because ananya ananya has is one of the few people who understands what one suffers when trying to write the biography of Dr. Ambedkar. And I speak of it as a, a kind of perilous enterprise. Um, and I'm going to discuss a little bit why that is, uh, but then of course move substantively into uh, what I think I have uh, uh, managed to achieve despite the, despite the perils. Um, back in 2010, I was working on a, a critical edition of the Buddha and his Dhamma. And in the course of the research, uh, of course, found this so-called um, unpublished uh, preface, a preface that Amitka had written that was um, suppressed, not included in the posthumous publication of the Buddha and his Dhamma. And upon reading that, uh, one finds, of course, the reason why it was suppressed, which is the gratitude he shows to Savata Ambedkar, not only for prolonging his life, but also really for being a fellow traveler in the process of choosing and converting to, to Buddhism. Uh, the former point, extending his life, flies in the face of the very 
reason behind its suppression, which is a, 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 a you know a conspiracy that she had actually been responsible for his his death. And um, yesterday, I was with uh, Praveen Chinde from JNU, and he told me a, a story from his childhood. He was eight eight years old, and he said that he saw a portrait of uh, Amitka and and my side with two laddus um, on a table. This is kind of painted portrait. And uh, his older brother told him, you see, these are the laddus with which uh, uh, Savata uh, poisoned uh, uh, Baba Sahib. And he told me that, you know, he was eight years old and he, he grew up uh, believing that. So these conspiracies were, you know, prevalent at the time. And uh, those who benefited from s the spreading of that conspiracy didn't want this preface to be included into, into the Buddha and Dhamma because it shows quite the opposite uh, was more likely the case. What it showed to me, obviously I never believed in that conspiracy theory, so that was not the interesting part. What it showed to me was a, a relationship between the personal and the intimate with the the public Ambedkar that uh, in a way that I had not really experienced before, especially around that time, 2010, um, I was still only seven years into a marriage with a, a Marathi speaker, and they give you a seven-year grace period <laughs> before, before they start to ridicule you and hound you and, and so on um, for your linguistic incompetence. Um, so at that time, uh, all I had access to was the French, German, and Hindi, and English works, and none of them had any insights into the personal. Of course, the Marathi literature is almost exclusively preoccupied with that in a, in a big way, but I didn't have access to that at the time. So I was quite intrigued by this discovery of the of of in, you know the sort of intimate details of Ambedkar and how much it impacted him as a public uh, figure, and I decided to try to look into that. Eventually, as I became more capable and got introduced to a far wider literature, I did indeed find that works like Karnode's twelve volume biography are you know full of intimate details, but the intriguing part that I discovered then was everything one learns about Ambedkar from Kailmode contradicts everything that so many things that one learns in other sources in the Anglophone uh, literature. So one problem was solved at finding the, the private, the intimate, the in, inner life of Ambedkar because he often revealed this not only to Kailmode and to other biographers also, one finds in his editorials, in the various papers, Bhaskar Bharat and Muknaik and so on, they're often littered with you know, personal and autobiographical details. In fact, I began to recognize over time that almost every time Ambedkar speaks to his community, he begins with autobiographical comments. But very rarely, when he's speaking to a general audience, does he does he um, do the same thing. So uh, I understood that this was perhaps in the process of, of his slow deification amongst the community, a way of reeling that back in and saying, I'm just like you, we're in this project together and you have to walk with me. So I don't think he wanted that, um, that uh, idolization to stand in the way of, of um, spreading of uh, the possibility for um, a million Ambedkars rather than, you know, just one demigod Ambedkar. So there are a lot of autobiographical fragments spread throughout editorials and speeches, but they, they seem to fly in the face of what we find in the Anglophone and uh, other literature. And I think it is fair to say, Ananya, you know, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to be with uh, Ananya, she can say whether this is an over gross generalization or if there's accuracy to it, that the Anglophone 
and European, French, German, uh, and Hindi literature all seems, vast majority of it seems to go back, to, you know, find its genealogy in, in Dananjay Kir's uh, very early biography. Um, the Marathi literature is far more vast. It's not academic um, only, uh, but, you know, tamashas and uh, oral histories and spontaneous eruptions of song and, you know, all, it's a, it's a very vast, um, uh, with many different genres, but the academic and intellectual output where, where you find literature with sources, you know, uh, noted and so on, all seems to go back to uh, Karmode. And so you have these two patient zeros, if you will, that what they would say um, becomes adopted into all of the subsequent literature the next 70, 70 years. Um, I think you probably know that in the last seven months, seven books have come out about Ambedkar. So my own uh, biography, um, which you can, you know, contrast with Ashok Gopal's uh, biography. These are the, bio you know, just biographies of Ambedkar. Um, and then there's there a kind of honing in on his time in New York and what he learned from John Dewey uh, there and how that influenced Ambedkar through the course of his life, that intellectual biography, with a parallel in this new book, uh, Ambedkar in London, which shows, you know, Ambedkar's time in London, similar to his time in New York, but it adds an element because it's not only the influence of London on Ambedkar, but the second part of the book is the influence of Ambedkar on, on London, which is fascinating. And uh, we can keep in mind the yesterday's passing of the California state legislature on the anti-caste discrimination. You know, th this had first happened in the UK and then later in, in, uh, in, on the west coast of the United States. So, so capturing also Ambedkar's influence on London is interesting in that book. But there we have four books. And then we have uh, Savata Ambedkar's own autobiography, which has long existed in Marathi and in Hindi, um, but uh, has been translated by Nadim Khan into English um, in a beautiful translation. I don't know if you saw the Hindi translation. That is absolutely horrible. And uh, unfortunately, that is the only thing that I had access to uh, for a long time. Um, and then there uh, is uh, Said Said's uh, re reading Ambedkar's Annihilation of Caste, I believe it's called. So uh, we have these seven books that have just uh, come out. You look at the, seven, the sources behind the seven books, and in a way you can verify or confirm what I had said, because uh, all but uh, Ashok Gopal, uh, rely on Kir primarily. I forgot to mention Shashi Tarur's biography. That's the seventh one. And if you look in Tarur, he has two sources, Jafalo and Kir. And who's Jafalo's source? It's Kir. So again, out, out of all of these biographies, they, they, they have their origin in, in Kir for personal details and you know, facts and so on. Ashok Gopal is different. Uh, it's more original, of course, with a lot of original research. But if you look at all of the citations about the personal life of Ambedkar, they're all Karmode. So Karmode is the source for Ashok Gopal. Um, and so even the last seven books, you can see uh, some kind of confirmation of this idea that all the Anglophone literature goes back to Kir and, and the Marathi uh, readers go back to, to Karmode. So what do we do first about you know, the initial problem of finding this relationship between the private man and the public man, the, the, the personal and the political, gets solved when you enter into the Marathi literature. But then the new problem of contradiction with the Anglophone literature and the other source document, uh, Kir, uh, comes to the fore. And when you realize that if you search elsewhere for information to verify Karmode and Kir, all you find are works that rely on Karmadin Kir. So you're left with a conundrum, which gets all the more formidable when one reads the way that both Kir and Karmode project their biographies as completely authentic. 
Kier's book has a starburst on the cover in every edition after Amitka's death that states the only biography read and authenticated by Ambedkar himself. Now, it's very difficult to look at that starburst on the cover and say, this is all wrong. I mean, what audacity. It states that it's the authentic biography confirmed by, read and confirmed by Ambedkar himself. And on the other hand, Khair Modi spent nine very close years with Ambedkar, sleeping you know, in Ambedkar's printing press, uh, their day and night, and even after their break and separation, despite maybe Ambedkar's attitude towards Karmadi, Karmadi remained devoted to not only documenting uh, Ambedkar's own life, but compiling a, a, a great, uh, a very vast uh, archive of the uh, Dalit movement um, uh, surrounding Ambedkar in that, in that time. And uh, it's one of the richest source for documents and um, uh, you know recollections and and interviews and and so on that uh, that we can find. So it's probably even more audacious to say that Karmodi is also full of mistakes. So now the field where one finds oneself, and I think, uh, and I knew you've written about how you found yourself in a similar situation um, is that we're confronted with authentic source books that that at least claim to be authentic that are full of gaps and lacunas and contradictory information and it goes beyond that because it turns out it's not only misinformation it's also disinformation when you start looking at whatever is left of the archives scattered as they are all over the country and the world, you can find things like the second page of the letter that Ambitka wrote to Savarkar, from, from which Dananjay Kir managed to construct a narrative that you, that from the 1950s that you can read in Swaraja magazine uh, every, every year, every you can't go three quarters without seeing an article about the friendly relationship between Ambedkar and Savarkar. There have been two recent biographies of Savarkar, uh, Purandre and, uh, and Sampad. And Sampad is a little less rigorous, but Purandre has this, um, this claim in the beginning about every archive that he's visited and how many you know, all he's poured through all the Maharashtra archives and the oral history archives in Cambridge and uh, India office papers in London. Basically, he's, he 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 mentions every place that he went, and there are, he went everywhere to find his source material. But it, when it comes time for Purandere to talk about the Savarkar Ambedkar relationship, is it archival work that he cites in Cambridge or in London or in Bombay State Archives or whatever? No, it's key which is absurd. So Kir published only the first page of a two-page letter that Ambedkar had sent to Savarkar. And on the first page, we find the typical cordialities that you would find for anyone that, you know, it, exactly. And even if you dislike the person, you don't start with, you bastard, right? You start with, hello, uh, I hope you're well, and this kind of thing. Now, Kir uses that um, cordiality to suggest an intimacy of a relationship upon which gets built subsequent decades worth of pseudo scholarship that it's not only their, that they were, you know, co uh, uh, cordial as persons, but they have ideological uh, overlap in certain respects. But when you try to find the because that's very difficult to accept when you try to find evidence for that ideological overlap, which you find in claimed in Purandre and Sampa, their sources, the cordiality. So the ideology is always based on the friendship. However, the friendship is itself a fiction because I have the second page of the letter. I've published it in the book. And the second page is the page where cordiality is left behind and Ambedkar totally rips into Savarkar in a way that is most savage, most savage. And um, 
so I introduced this not only because of how interesting it is in itself, but to suggest that there's not only misinformation in Kir, there's also disinformation in Kir. And probably we can understand the reasons why. Kir was engaged in this process of you know, writing biographies. He had already, what else had he done? Fule, he had done Ambedkar, he had done Shahu Maharaj, and of course, Savakar and Gandhi. And his Savakar biography is cited very, very frequently by the current biographers. So in a way, it still stands as, uh, you know, a, a kind of classic in that uh, set of studies. And I personally would find it very difficult psychologically if my two heroes were Ambedkar and Savakar. And I mean, that's a bit schizophrenic. And I, I could understand trying to find ways to suture them. If it can't be done in fact, then, you know, at least in fiction. And Kier engaged in that fiction and just as some evidence of it, even assuming that Savakar and Ambedkar's relationship was as uh, friendly or cordial as it was, he still only claims one to two personal interact, personal meetings face to face. And yet, Savakar's name appears statistically every nine pages of Kier's Ambedkar biography, every nine pages, which means that you combine Gandhi, Nehru, and Ambedkar's own wife. And they still don't come to the same number of appearances of the name Savarkar as in Kier's biography. So even if there were a cordial relationship, it was not you know, intimate to that uh, degree by any stretch of the imagination. So Kier is up to a lot of you know, creative writing, <laughs> we could say, in his biography. So not only misinformation, but also disinformation. And as we discover that, it helps us to overcome the audacity of that uh, starburst saying the only authentic uh, biography about Ambedkar. But there's still the mystery of did Ambedkar read it and what did he have to say about it? Fortunately, we have some contemporary uh, testimony. It's not completely reliable, but it gives a hint about Ambedkar's attitude uh, to that biography, which in one telling account, which I have um, repeated in the book, uh, he Ambedkar picks it up, looks at the table of contents, thumbs through a few uh, pages, says that it's not really everything. And in a Marathi uh, account, it's not me uh, in this biography. And he puts it down never to, never to pick it up again. Sabata Ambedkar's biography, autobiography, also gives an interesting account of the interviews between Kir and Ambedkar. The third, and there were only three, the third of which happens while Ambedkar has suffered a stroke and has a feeding tube in his, down his throat. Um, and Kir, of course, is asking him questions and he has no way to, 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 to answer them. So uh, beyond just realizing that Kir had his own project, had introduced fiction into the narrative for his own reasons, it's the claim of authenticity is also an outright uh, fabrication that Ambedkar read and approved it. He looked at it, and by contemporary accounts, he did not um, approve of it. So that's that. Nevertheless, even in the most recent biographies, like Shashi Tharoor's just out uh, within the last six months, things that Kir claims are taken up as, as fact. And this becomes significant not only because of the disinformation, but even the misinformation itself. The case of, of Kaimode uh, is very, very different because Kaimode, as I mentioned, was sincere and dedicated. The problems arose in the very process of his attempts to verify facts. I don't think he even really tried. Uh, in Kaimode, when he tried, it created the trouble. So. Obviously, Karmadi was unable to travel to New York or to London, but he quite systematically wrote letters to Columbia University, to the Registrar, to LSE, to the University of London, and to the High Commission in India, trying to get details. The strange thing is that in that moment, in that decade, you know, in the 1950s, they weren't that interested in their alum in Ambedkar. He they didn't, you know, they didn't monopolize on the father of the Indian constitution as, you know, uh, they'd given the 
uh, honorary doctorate in in uh, New York, but it wasn't, you know, you can't walk on either of these campuses today without running into some uh, proclamation of Ambedkar studied here. But in, at, in that era, they, they really couldn't care less. And in answer, in reply to Karmadi's questions, you get very quick uh, replies to his queries. Don't, and they don't answer all of his questions. They don't bother. And in those they do answer, they misinform him. And it's ironic because the things that they misinform him about are, for example, what year did he get his degree? <laughs> You know, this has been baffling because all of the Anglophone literature has repeated over and over again that it was his Columbia University degree was from 1916 when it was in fact from 27. And these are not just the just issues of chronology. Many of us probably remember that when Ambedkar did return to uh, Bombay, he was felicitated by a group of uh, untouchable sort of seniors who were so. Um, uh, proud that one of their community has earned a PhD just as such, and then more so that he had earned it from, from abroad. And Ambedkar didn't show up to that felicitation. Now, people have you know, wondered why, why did he not show up? And then Kier has writes some fictitious account of why that is. But the obvious answer is because he didn't have a PhD. They were felicitating him for something he had not achieved. Uh, so these things, these dates do matter in different ways um, later in his life. So Karmadi is attempting to verify facts, but they are not uh, cooperating. And he's continuously misinformed from the places that he's trying to seek information. And it gets worse because once, for example, LSE realized that they had this famous, magnificent historical personage as their alum, they decided they need to start popularizing it. And so they requested the famous biographer of Ambedkar, mm -hmm. Karmode, to send them an account of Ambedkar's life. And what does Karmode send them? The same misinformation he received from them a decade before. So you start getting a cross-contamination of the archives. And uh, <laughs> so Karmode's efforts very, it's a very different project from what Kears was, you know, in every way, shape, and form. But he was thwarted due to uh, the very process of trying to be more, uh, more rigorous. And then we come to something that I think is a little bit funny, um, and that is there's still the issue, irrespective of misinformation and disinformation and cross contamination and so on. There's still the issue that Karmadi spent nine years with. Ambedkar and Kir ostensibly, you know, three interviews. So why, if the source is right there, what difference does it make what Columbia or New York or uh, uh, London say? And here it's intriguing because as we all know, Ambedkar, as I had mentioned, he only spoke about his personal life autobiography in respect of hortatory appeals to his community in public speeches, that bizarre, uh, autobiographical preface for the Buddha and his Dhamma, and then one other work, wait, what's called Waiting for a Visa. And Waiting for a Visa indicates that there were moments of his life that he felt were actually important enough to, to publicize of his autobiography. So he selects them. He talks about them. For example, his time in New York, his time in Baroda. And he says, I can't think back about the time in Baroda with, you know, when he had to pretend to be a Parsi to get into, to have a place to stay. I can't think back about that time without tears welling up in my eyes. So these are very personally significant moments for Ambedkar. And yet, <laughs> the dates are all wrong. When he was in Baroda, Ambedkar himself gets wrong in waiting for a visa. When he was in New York, Ambedkar himself writes the wrong uh, dates. Now, how can that be? Well, he was more or less completely indifferent to issues like this. He spoke about uh, the ego of autobiography in some of his newspaper editorials and contrasting it with Anatta. He spoke about, um, uh, well, you know, other people during the Constituent Assembly, there are many uh, uh, parallel memoirs that one can consult about 
interactions with Ambitka, and they would say when we needed to know not only an article, but the case law, the history of that article, and so on, instead of going to the library, they would just say, Ambitka, what happened with you know 162? And then he would give them a full summary. So he had a kind of photographic memory when it came to economic matters, legislation, and things like that. But he was totally indifferent to things of his own life. And I think one can understand that. He's in the middle of drafting constitution and so on, and someone comes up to him and says, were you in New York in 1915? He said, yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so I think he was just indifferent to these facts. And I, I sympathize with it because I grew up with a academic a father who was very, very similar, photographic memory, but couldn't tell you what he had had for breakfast, you know, if you, if you asked. And it's, I don't think it's that uncommon. The absent-minded professor is a kind of caricature of that. Whatever the reasons, here's an entryway into understanding why those who had access to Ambedkar nevertheless didn't have access to fully authentic information, as ironic as that sounds. So now to the to the, to the attempt to reconstruct. So there's, instead of relying on information from registrars and you know, the good will of librarians and, and so on, people in today's age, if you have the resources, can just go to the sources themselves. So trips to London and to LSE into the uh, India Office Library and the secret documents section and New York and Columbia and possibly equally importantly, the fact that newspapers have all been digitized. So one can track Ambedkar's life from 1891 to 1956 with a few you know, key taps. Now, you probably know Tipradaman Singh's uh, 16 Stormy Days, this kind of strange uh, analysis of uh, the First Amendment to the Constitution. And one thing that Daman says in that book, which I find really strange, he'll say, Ambedkar characterized this phenomenon, whatever, as this, but it can't be so because the Times of India reported it like this. In other words, he assumes that the content of a paper, you know, a Bania run paper by capitalists with an interest in undermining a lot of what Ambedkar and Nehru and so on were, were doing, he assumes that their version, their rendition in terms of content is reliable. I, I don't think that that's, it's possible at all to take the content of the Bombay Chronicle or the Times of India or the New York Times or the London Times or whatever, as, um, as more reliable than the testimony of any other person who might have been in Ambedkar's orbit. But there is one thing we can rely on, which is that the journalist has no interest in getting a date and a place and a time and even a subject of a talk wrong. And so what we can do is use as one guardrail the history of all of these newspapers which are available to us to find out when was Ambedkar at place X or what was he saying at place Y on this day and date? And one can actually piece together, you know, a chronology of his life just from contemporary accounts and papers, even ignoring what it is they say he was doing and its meaning and its significance. And that is invaluable to trying to understand where he was without relying on Kir and Karmode. A couple of things that come up, for example, there's often this tale told, you find in both Kir and Karmadi, about Amitka's time in Germany, uh, that he ostensibly went there to study Sanskrit and, um, and so on. Uh, we have the letter that he had written to the Prussian Ministry of State applying for university and so on. But newspaper accounts show that he was not there at the time that Kir states that he was there because they mention him in London at, uh, on the same day. And looking further into to that then allows one to get a better understanding of what he might have been trying to do in Germany, given the time that he was actually there rather than what Kier, when Kier uh, puts him there and so on. So uh, it is very valuable for reconstructing um, 
to have access to these kinds of objective uh, references in terms of chronology, irrespective of content. On the other side, the vastness of the literature, there will be various accounts of where Amitkar was in conflicting reports about the same event. One can give greater credibility to those that match the chronology that's available in a report. So if a New York Times article says he was there on December 7th, and one of the testimonies that you find says he was there on December 7th, while the others say 9th or 12th, then a priori, it seems this one is more, more reliable. So one tries to put together uh, uh, by you know, triangulating different sources of information not traceable back to Kiran Kainmadi, um, a fresh narrative, a fresh account. I had said that my project was to uncover the relationship of the personal and the public. But in the effort to do that, I encountered a deeper problem, which was the corruption of all of the sources, the limitations of the sources, the inaccessibility and so on, which Ananya has written you know, flawlessly about. That's, that's, the, that's the status, that's the state of uh, things, uh, what she's you know, outlined in her article on the condition of the archives and so on. So the effort then becomes trying to recreate a narrative uh, as though Kiran Karmodi had not written at all. It's a very perilous process. Um, in the, uh, I mean, I've given sort of indications and markers of how I managed to reconstruct it. So going back to this relationship of the personal and the, and the public and some things that come out from this completely different approach to reconstructing Ambedkar's life from all of the others, including the six other books that I had mentioned, which rely on Kier and Karmati. So some, you know, some parts of his life that I find wonderful. So we all know the image of Ambedkar in the suit and the tie you know, holding the constitution, all of his public statuary and so on. And of course, we understand the way that it sets up a contrast to Gandhi and um, uh, represents, you know, a forward-looking versus a backward-looking and all of the interpretations of their, their contradictory kind of statuary. But what about, where did he get these suits? <laughs> when and why did he start wearing these suits in the first place? When you go back to the Baroda State Archives, you forget about Karmodi, you forget about Kir. What you'll find are papers that tell us completely, a completely different story from what we've all inherited. Ambedkar was not originally sent to Colombia to study economics. His first Hazur order was to go to London to study pedagogy. And it was a conversation with Shahu Maharaj that changed the venue from London to New York, which the Baroda bureaucrats were totally opposed to because at that time, New York was more expensive than London, the education there. But there's an interesting hint in the current, currently available uh, sources, like you'll find at the um, Symbiosis um, Museum in, in Pune, that gives the order for, Colum for Ambedkar to go study at Columbia, but it says something very strange. It says Ambedkar will go for a period of two years to study in masters at Columbia, not pedagogy. Now, what kind of order is that? It ha so I had to get to the bottom of why, why does it say not pedagogy? Well, it says not pedagogy. We all know what bureaucrats are like. Once something is on a file, it's always on a file. So when they had finally decided through renegotiations that he wasn't going to London to study pedagogy, he was going to New York to study economics, the file remained, right, or the, the back papers. And so some bureaucrat typed in, not pedagogy, remembering the earlier file. So um, there are, in these archives, so many fascinating uh, details that sort of explain what is already public but misunderstood. And, and one of the things I like most is a, is a letter mentioning to Ambedkar that Colombia is a very aristocratic place and you don't walk into that campus dressed uh, like a slob. You need a fine suit. And so we are, the, the Maharaja has, how is that stated? Something like has condescended to grant you um, uh, rupees five 
uh, hundred as outfit allowance for the purchase of a suit proper to the occasion. Yes, or three hundred or something like that. But uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, it was an enormous amount of money. And so what he did with this was to tailor very fine suits. And this is in 1913. And the statuary today, you know, we find the origin of that in this one little micro event in in um, in Baroda. So uh, there, there are innumerable things. L later on, we find out that when Baroda is trying to get the money back from Ambedkar, since he never managed to fulfill his obligation to work for 10 years for the state, given that he couldn't find a place to live and he was humiliated and so on, we discover that the amount they were trying to uh, recuperate was uh, 21,000 rupees. That means that all of his studies in Colombia and LSE and so on over the course of those years was 21,000 rupees. And if you divide it by the, 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 the amount of time more he needed to come back to India with his PhD and his bar at law, it comes to around 5,250 rupees. Now, this becomes relevant later on because there is another false history about Ambedkar that circulates in all of the biographies, going back to both Kiran and Karimode, that Ambedkar was offered a high court judgeship precisely because of his uh, brilliance as an advocate and his you know, proficiency in the Bombay fraternity of, of lawyers in the appellate side of the, of the court. And that persists because we all want to, we all you know, understand the magnitude of his intelligence and that he had worked so diligently on the constitution and so on. So it's, it's consistent. But when you go to see the archives in, uh, in London, what you find is that the origin of the offer for a high court judgeship came from B.G. Kher, the leader of, the, of Congress, eventually first prime minister of uh, Bombay state called, I mean, we say chief minister, but prime minister at that time. And you find a, set of letters going back and forth between Kir, the Secretary of State, and the Viceroy himself. And Kir is saying, get Ambedkar uh, appointed as a high court judge. And the Viceroy and the Secretary of State are saying, what is, why is Kir saying this? And then the Secretary of State says, it's obvious why he's saying this, because this is the only way to get that meddling you know, person out of politics. You cannot, as a high court judge, you can't have Mahad Satyagraha. You can't, uh, you know, lead the, start leading a, a party that uh, poses the challenges, not only electorally but ideologically to to Congress. And so, Kerr was behind this effort. And what's fascinating is a volley of letters between the Secretary of State and the Viceroy, s speculating if we appoint Ambedkar as High Court judge, who will succeed him in his movement? And the answer they found was he has no successor. He has only a predecessor, S.K. Bole, who was probably, what, 20 years senior to, to Ambedkar. So the viceroy writes, his only successor is his predecessor, who is a brilliant man with great character, but nothing of the charisma and capabilities of Ambedkar. If we appoint him high court judge, that is the end of the untouchable movement in India. Now. Ambedkar's own letters to his friends upon the appointment tells a very interesting story, which is that he needed 5,250 rupees to stay on in, for his education in London, which he never had. And now he's being offered nearly 5,000 rupees a month as a high court judge. He's been totally elbowed and alienated from the legal fraternity. The Brahmin lawyers have ensured that he gets no cases. Rohit Day has, a has found a beautiful Times of India article stating that on the very same day, in the very same court, in adjacent courtrooms, um, uh, 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 Jinnah was uh, trying a case over a sum of two and a half lakh rupees, and Ambedkar in the next room is trying a case of a sum of 24 rupees. And of course, Ambedkar writes, as we see in his letters to Savita Ambedkar, he writes about how he was pushed out of the, his legal uh, career by the Brahmin lawyers. And in his personal letters at the time of offering, you can see him delighting in the idea that now these Brahmin lawyers will be in his courtroom. 
And instead of throwing files at him and not letting him drink water, he's the one who's going to tell them what to do. So you have this financial interest, you have this, you know, this, this redemption from the humiliation that he's had to suffer. You also have um, his personal orientation. I document in the book, you know, how books are so significant to him. They're his refuge. Even in Baroda, he mentions that, you know, when it, he's humiliated at the office, he just goes to the library and he seeks refuge in books. And that was throughout his entire life. You know, Rajgrua was, his home was built specifically as a, as a repository for his vast library. So he also mentions that as a high court judge, I can do what I like most, which is sit and read in tranquility. So you get these, the seductions of the greatest kind to Ambedkar to be a high court judge, and he is so tempted by the offer. And he concludes the same thing that the viceroy concludes. If I give in to this seduction, then the only successor I have is my predecessor, S.K. Bowling, and it will be the end of the Dalit movement. And I find that parallel recognized by the vi Viceroy and the Secretary of State, recognized by Ambedkar and his friend. And this story, of course, gives a very different understanding of what is just glibly mentioned in Kir and Karmodi, that Ambedkar was a great lawyer, and so he was offered the high court judgeship. There's another history, right? A completely different with so much color and uh, so much significance. We also find something about the personality of Ambedkar right there, which is his willingness to make sacrifices, personal sacrifices for the cause, sacrifices of everything that would be personally fulfilling to him. And as I mentioned, the uh, Francis Proust or Fanny F instance, that personal relationship, the fact that he did not pursue it precisely for his cause is just another instance of the, the sacrifices, he, the most intimate sacrifices he would make to pursue the, uh, his mission. Um, now, I can go on really forever with all of these little details and stories. There's so many uh, things, uh, one of which I think is significant this moment, and I'll end with it. Uh, as I had mentioned, the California state legislature has now passed that um, uh, anti-caste discrimination law, and that wouldn't have been possible without an alliance between uh, Black rights and, uh, and Dalit, uh, uh, Dalit organizations in the United States. And when you see the relationship between the Black movement and the Dalit movement in the U.S., in North America more generally, you, 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 you hear them often harken back to Ambedkar's own experiences on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, Harlem, um, and his inspiration by the black, uh, the emerging black uh, 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 civil rights movement in Harlem at the time. But if you go to the place itself, you find, no, in the first place, we have to know that um, white American men are not going to put an Ivy League university in a black neighborhood. So Harlem was not always Harlem. Harlem was very, very white. And if you look at the demographic maps that exist in the New York uh, uh, City archives, you see that Columbia was very white while Ambedkar was there, each of these accommodations. So Jabbar Patel's fanciful, you know, dishwasher, black dishwasher friend that Ambedkar has in that movie. I mean, this is total fiction. But it's important today to kind of imagine that, that original relationship because it strengthens the contemporary one. And of course, everybody points to Ambedkar's letter to W.B. Du Bois and so on, but that's 1940s, right? The Harlem Renaissance didn't even happen while Ambedkar was in there. It comes in the next decade. So this is an or original myth. But where did Ambedkar get the idea to transform a grassroots social movement like the non brahmin movement, Satyashoda, uh, all of the inspirations that go into the way he thinks about it, to reorient it as a movement for rights, civil rights, and so on? If it wasn't the Blacks, then what was it? One of the things I discovered that is most delightful to me because of its significance, not only for the feminist Ambedkar, but also for understanding his, the continuity of his thoughts from the Hindu code bill all the way back to the very first writing, the caste in India paper, uh, conceiving of caste not as a spiritual hierarchy or purity hierarchy, but fundamentally 
connected to the control of women's sexuality, that patriarchy is in India is Brahminical patriarchy and Brahminism is patriarchal. Um, it turns out that in Ambedkar's own class, sharing the same supervisors was Mabel Lee. Yeah, John Dewey. Mabel Lee was a woman suffragist leader, student, fellow student at Columbia University uh, uh, in the courses at the same time, in the classrooms at the same time with the same supervisors. And as we all know, when you supervise your students, you put the like-minded ones together and have them discuss. Well, Mabel Lee had led the previous year to Ambedkar joining Columbia, had led a 50 women horseback march from George Washington Square or whatever that's called, where NYU is up Fifth Avenue, Washington Square up Fifth Avenue, 50 women on horseback. She was in the lead and 10,000 people marching behind. And who was marching? Behind Mabel Lee, John Dewey, and Seligman, Ambedkar's supervisor, and um, Simkovich, the Ambedkar's teacher of Marx. And Simkovich was Mabel Lee's supervisor, and Ambedkar and her were in five classes together. And even more important, um, there are those evenings where students get together and read out papers and so on. I found a paper that Mabel Lee read when Ambedkar was in the same cosmopolitan um, uh, Resonance that if you remove the word woman and you replace it with untouchable is identical to a passage that Ambedkar uses uh, a couple of years later speaking on the issue of untouchability and relation to democracy. In other words, it wasn't the black civil rights, the emerging black civil rights movement that so imprinted on young Ambedkar how to mold the emerging um, uh, uh, social movement into a civil rights one, but the women's suffrage movement that, that, did, uh, that did that. And I think that's very significant for understanding many of his subsequent writings and the unique position that he takes uh, throughout his life, including Annihilation of Caste and his insistence on including his work on Brahminical Patriarchy into the second edition of Annihilation of Caste, his article on Hin the decline and fall of the Hindu woman, and of course, his work on the Hindu Code Bill. So, uh, so this process, thankfully, I wanted just to start understanding the man Ambedkar in relation to the public Ambedkar, but it, you know, I, I fell into this kind of, you know, this vortex of misinformation and so on. But in the process of trying to emerge from that, I feel like I found even more about the person of Ambedkar in relation to his public and political uh, career. And all of that I've tried to capture into, in, the, in the biography. Um, there's a lot more to say, but, uh, you know, read the book, maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Akash. That was um, as deeply felt, I think, as it was deeply researched. Uh, and that's always... Um, It's always better to hear than 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 something that's um, you know undertaken without uh, so much of an emotional and personal investment. Um, I'll just since you since you <laughs> said you wanted to come here to be able to compare notes in in some sense, I'll just make a couple of remarks. But we have such a big audience, I should um, I should open it up for questions. Um, You know, I've visited almost all the places that you uh, mention in your book that you visited in search of Ambedkar. Um, pretty much all of them. Um, and I found repeatedly, um, whether it was in in Bombay or in um, Baroda or in... New York or in London or in Delhi or in um, Nasik or in Pune or wherever um, or in Aurangabad that um, you know you could find the address you could find the building you could find the house the library the archive the the historic place where he had passed through or he had spent some time or to which he had some connection. 
but these visits or these sightings or these uh, entries into spaces etc did not necessarily yield uh, an insight into the man um, and that uh, almost no place was there any trace of him as such uh, either because he had not been memorialized uh, or because he was very young at the time that he went to these places and you're still dealing with the first part of his life in this volume. And so there, you know, if you think about it logically, there's no reason for anyone to remember a young student or a young boy or, or you know, a struggling academic or a struggling future politician or a future leader or a future intellectual. There's absolutely no reason why, you know, in our youth, we don't leave any any trace, as it were. And, and, and so it was with Ambedkar, which is not, I mean, one has to correct oneself when thinking that this is a form of discrimination against him. Uh, many times it isn't. It's just the oblivion of, of, of time and of history that, um, you know, the value of a man is only understood uh, long after, uh, or perhaps in retrospect, and so on. And many of these places where you do find today some uh, sort of indication, a plaque or a statue or a photograph or, you know, some some kind of a, an attempt to mark that place as being associated with Ambedkar. Um, it's nonetheless, uh, either bland or wrong, okay. it, you know. I mean, it 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 once again does nothing to 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 uh, establish the presence uh, uh, or the 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 reality of the existence uh, of this person. How he would have experienced Morningside Heights, or how he would have experienced chalk farms and Primrose Hill or how he would have walked through those corridors in that BIT chawl uh, in Bombay and so on. Um, so I think the years spent wandering uh, in, in places, um, I think you've done very, very well to supplement those with other kinds of explorations um, of the interiority and the reality and the truth of this life um, through the kind of uh, deconstruction and reconstruction that that you know you've undertaken in in this very sensitive manner. Um, one of the things that I found helpful, uh, apart from the the occasional letters and the occasional, as you said, um, references that he makes to his own distress or to his own um, memory of, of, a, of a traumatic experience, uh, you know, um, apart from those rare and sometimes misleading kind of, uh, you know, testimonials that he, that he might have, I've often found it telling, um, for example, to see a photograph of him with his dog or know that he played the violin or to know that he um, uh, had very poor health and that most of his ailments were of a nervous nature. Um, the intensity of the gaze, which is not there in almost all the formal and official um, uh, sta you know, statues and, and the calendar art and the popular art, but it sometimes comes through in some of the photographs um, and you see the profound anger and hurt in, in the man. You just see it. You can just see it. There's, there's no sort of arguing with that, you know, um, which is absolutely taken away in those formal portraits with the, with, the, with the blue suit and the pen and the copy of the constitution and so on. Um, I've also come across accounts many times of how uh, fellow lawyers 
uh, and legislators and people he worked with in whatever capacity, wherever, um, would refuse to sit and eat with him. And this has always stayed with me as, as a, you know, as a form of so social isolation that all his education and all his erudition and all his cosmopolitanism does not necessarily allow him to overcome uh, even as he gets older and older and more and more powerful and public in his in his activities, um, the fact that he can't share a meal uh, with his peers in a professional setting is something that I've always felt provides a certain kind of clue, um, you know, uh, when trying to re rebuild some sense of the personality from under all of this um, lack of information incorrect information, fabrication, and corrupted uh, and lost, uh, you know, uh, records, uh, in a sense. Um, so I've, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that you've, you've clarified many things, as, as has that translation of uh, Savita Ambedkar's memoirs. Um, and uh, at least one or two chapters that I've seen of the book about his time in London. Um, which you know has 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 done really stellar service in um, showing us, um, just like Scott's work has shown us, you know what was happening at Columbia. Um, William Gold's work shows us what was happening at the LSE. So who were his classmates, uh, both Indian and international? How did they then become political leaders, social leaders, intellectuals? lawyers, etc., in their own context when they went back to their countries. Um, so it really creates a sense of a cohort uh, and, a, and a zeitgeist uh, to which he had access, you know, no matter what his handicaps, he had access to that in those years that he was a student overseas. And so reconstructing that world is very important. And I think um, the work on John Dewey, and as you're saying, um, you know, uh, on the on the women's uh, the the suffragist the suffragist movement, um, it's is important because like you, I mean, I, I I went looking for, you know, a civil rights movement that didn't exist and a Harlem Renaissance that was yet to be and a relationship to Du Bois that you know was much later and, um, you know, a connection with the NAACP that, you know, were we're so far after the fact that that they're not uh, significant biographically in the same order as as we might have been led to expect by uh, by Keir and also by Jabbar Patel's film, uh, which is which is touching but also fanciful, I think, in many ways. Um, so thank you for uh, bringing forth very clearly the problem of the unreliability of your fundamental primary sources. Um, I wouldn't have doubted Kermore. I've always doubted Kir, but I wouldn't have doubted Kermore necessarily, um, partly because it's a 12 volume work. It's in Marathi. There's always more there than one is reading, you know, um, and you think in the end, if I don't find something, it'll be there. Um, but maybe that's not, not the case. Um, the archives are a mess and you and I know that, I think. Um, uh, the kind of grief that that causes one cannot overcome in many cases. Um, but the personality question that you have uh, foregrounded, I think, uh, can really add value to the scholarship. Um, and um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, but we can, of course, uh, keep talking later as well. Thank you. Please raise your hands if you'd like to ask anything or if you have a comment, Dhananjay, please. And use the mic if you would. Ayodhya ji, camera is that getting it? This is very general. Uh, I mean, unlike Ambedkar, unlike Gandhi and Nehru, Ambedkar did not write autobiography. So what could be the principal reason for not making individual or individual as a being very important part of his becoming? So one. Second, uh, 
how do you locate the process or uh, the process of a uh, uh, um, which we call phenomenology in in Ambedkar, where experience would be very, very important in this entire process. Because three important components of his time, uh, family, civil society, and state, were there. And the state, you have lots of writing by Ambedkar, but uh, family and civil societies are primarily missing in, in his writings, which is not part of autobiography. So how, uh, uh, do these become very, very important in Ambedkar's writing? And third, uh, unlike many other thinkers, we know Ambedkar through his writings, not through uh, 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 raw materials or raw resources. So where do you see connect and disconnect between raw resources and his writings, uh, Ambedkar's uh, slew of uh, volumes which you which, which are available before us. Sorry, Thananjay, uh, what do you mean by raw? Raw resources in a sense that which are, they are not looked at, not theorized. People have not written about it. Like, and they are there. Like uh, what? Uh, various writings which are uh, not- I mean not published? Not published in a sense that uh, some thoughts, some musings, about, uh, for example, if you look at the several volumes, you have uh, one or two pages on various topics, mm -hmm. which are, uh, which you can combine, uh, for example, on, uh, you can have a theory of then humiliation or enlightenment or, or modernity. So you have one on two, two pages in Ambedkar's writings, but they are, they remain incomplete. So how do how those are very important in his writings or 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 his, his plethora of writings? So you you're saying fragments that do not become part of books, maybe something like that. Okay, I think for that the best. I, I don't know if this is what's in your head. Bhagwandas is Ambedkar speaks. You know the these are like fragments that are very profound, insightful, but just not developed in, in any way. So maybe that is uh, what you're thinking. Should I go ahead? Um, uh, I think around 2017, 18, I wrote this book called The Philosophy of Autobiography. And in that, the question, the first question about why no autobiography of Ambedkar sort of preoccupied me. And the best thing that I could come up with, though it was obviously colored by my work on the Buddha and his Dhamma was that Ambedkar was really uh, tuned in to the notion of anatta and the, the, the idea that the process of writing an autobiography is a, is, is a very severe attachment uh, to the, an amplification of the ego. But this is really speculative. Um, his, own, his own statements about, you know, he said he wanted to write two biographies, one of a false Mahatma and one of a true one. So Fule and Gandhi. Um, and if, if uh, you know, the publisher wanted me to remove that line. Strange. Anyway, um, if, uh, if he wants to do something like this, it shows that he is connected in some way to the value of biography. In fact, Given what I had spoken about, the perils, what Ananya had spoken about, the status of the archives, I almost thought I can't do this. I just, just it's just not, it's not possible to, to, to reconstruct Ambedkar without Kiran Kaiman. And then I read Ambedkar's own letter to, to his wife, urging her to read biography and why biography is so significant. And when I read that, it just gave me the motivation to, to do this work. And he writes that, you know, every man or woman's experience is very limited and we need biography to transcend our social location and, you know, material limitations and so on and exercise the imagination to understand the lived experiences uh, of the other, especially the other that we have othered. And, um, and this is, you know, one of the, his arguments. And then a second argument that he makes, um, equally philosophical and equally profound, is that he uses biographies of others to select from them virtues or 
that he wants in his own character. And then he adds very quickly in very typical Amit Galat fashion. However, if you don't mind me saying, I am a very original person. <laughs> you know? um, so he says, but I use biography to construct my own original self. Now these, when I read that he had insisted on biography reading and that he wanted to write two biographies, I felt that the biography must be written irrespective of you know, how difficult a process it has been. And it's been, you know, Ananya's article is very, you know, anyone who tries to go through this knows that you just end up crying <laughs> sometimes, you know, when you get to an archive and they will not let you in under any condition and you by hook and by crook and contacts and I'll call this minister and, you know, all of that, you get in, there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, they just, it's the absent center in some Zizekian kind of, so um, uh, it's very difficult to do, but the importance for Amitka of biography is so fascinating considering his refusal to write an autobiography. So my speculation that it has to do with Anatta is consistent with a lot of what he says, but it's not fully satisfactory. Um, lived experience I think, I don't know what you think about this. I think there's a movement by American scholars to begin to say, you sent us a, a boy and we sent you back Ambedkar. And uh, so I don't think Scott is really doing that, but there, it's it's becoming so prevalent in American writings on Ambedkar that we made this man. But you have to understand, Colombia had a lot of intelligent people, um, maybe as intelligent as Ambedkar. They had a lot of resources and so on, but they didn't produce Ambedkars, right? Only one Ambedkar came out of that process. So there are other circumstances that we have to account for beyond the education. And those are, I think, the lived experiences. So I see it as, you know, Hilal and others who are friends know that I'm really a Hegelian. So I see this as a process of um, uh, content and form. So the lived experience, I mean, the cast paper that Ambedkar presented shows how significant it, it is to, to live that in order to write something innovative about it. Because all of the anthropologists had contributed something, the sociologists or whatever, but he was the only one who presented something totally innovative and say, no, that can't be right. I know it's not right, and that can't be right. I know that it's not right. So the 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 I think the magic ingredient to coming up with an Ambedkar, irrespective of the intelligence and the education, which was you know uh, uh, incredible, is that social formation that comes from the community, from the chal where he lived, from the Satisho, the predecessors, and consequently his dedication to Fule and so on. But I would disagree with you about, you know, family, civil society, and state, because yes, we have state through the published books and so on, but we also get a focus on civil society through all of the editorials of Muknayak and, and Bhaskar Bharat. This is where he really took it up. And then fortunately we have the family uh, through his personal correspondence and letters, because every letter was a, had something about his family, every one of them. Even when he's suffering a crisis of, um, you know, Muknayak is being taken away from him and he's railing against the editor for backstabbing and so on. And P.S., how is my son? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so no matter what he's up to, he's, he's still integrally related. Oh, oh, it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So, so the, so the letters really provide it. But I mean, you're right that the public Ambedkar is all about the state, but there are other resources that are, I mean, that's why I spend so much time with the newspaper articles because people haven't seen them really, but they add this other dimension of the mediation of family and state through civil society that I think is, is, is significant. And I think we already spoke about Bhagwan Das and Ambedkar Speaks and those, those kinds of fragments of Ambedkar, there's a danger to theorizing them because I think there are, there's a lot of work that I really am disconnected from, uh, like um, 
Ambedkar and other immortals and uh, Ashwari Kumar's book and so on. They're wonderful people. I like them very much. But when I read those books, I don't know what on earth they're talking about. It's not the Ambedkar that I have ever experienced, you know? So uh, there's something dangerous about theorizing on the basis of fragments, I feel, and removing it from lived experience and an organic account of his life. And uh, uh, so I, you know, that's something I just don't want to be a party to. between you and Dhananjay. So I just want to add to this conversation by highlighting what you said, uh, but in a different way, especially when we, the idea of biography uh, rests on something called extraordinariness of life. So we have to make a distinction between life as life and life as an extraordinary life. Now, this idea of extraordinary is coming from various sources. And you, the biographer, has got something to do with this extraordinariness. And that's why you are spending so much of time uh, in looking at those years when this extraordinariness was not there. Not, not there, meaning that it was just in the process of becoming. Yeah, and that's the, that's why this wonderful title, Becoming Baba Sahib. Now, in this whole process, you as a biographer is also doing a very interesting and important job. And because you are a philosopher, I think that's that's why I'm asking you to provide a context to the answer which you just gave to Dhananjay. Is basically that we, as when we write, we collect, obviously you spend a lot of time in explaining your distrust on sources and your evaluation of sources. But there is something more to that. And that is that we, when we select events, we connect to episodes, we construct a narrative, and then we place the narrative in a discourse. And the extraordinariness is coming out from discourse. Now, in this uh, sequence of trajectory, I think the connection which you are providing, like, in a passing reference, you said something, cause. In a passing reference, you also mentioned that you speculate Ambedkar would have said this or that. I think yourself as an author and as a biographer is very crucial in order to understand at least this volume. So I would like you to explain a bit more of your engagement as an author, as a biographer, to those areas which were. Uh, yet to be covered, yet to be seen from the perspective of life, not extraordinariness. I have a slightly uh, connected thing, and I'm curious because you made this distinction between the Anglophone sources and the non-Marathi sources, right? So what, what, what is the kind of intimacy uh, that we get there? Uh, do we get a, you know, those traces of becoming great in those uh, the Marathi sources? What are the sense? What is the censorship being put on when we look at the Marathi? So, what? How much are we allowed to gossip about Ambedkar, for example? Or is he worth gossiping about at all at that juncture? Or is he already becoming a great person that should not be gossiped about? That's important because as a film historian, right? Uh, I can see that uh, 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 it's not easy to gossip in Hindi. Uh, people learn how to gossip about stars. Uh, uh, so there's an exception like you know, holy it becomes the occasion when you do this uh, uh, gossiping about you know stars uh, and producers and directors and their illicit relationships, etc. Illicit relationships, etc. So uh, I'm I'm curious intimacy. Uh, but what kind of intimacy that would give us some sense of uh, the construction of Baba Sahab, great Baba. All right, thank you. Um, uh,
yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Hilal, you, 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 you phrased the question very, in a way that is somewhat intimidating because it's very profound. It's the role of the author. I myself had made this flippant remark that, you know, if my two heroes were Ambedkar and Savarkar, I also would have, you know, to, to psychoanalyze Keir for what he had done. And now you've turned it back on, <laughs> on me. This is, uh, um, this is proper due for what, uh, what I had said. But... Um, I like how you point, I mean, the, I see the questions as very related. So, um, the, the title, you know, is both becoming in the sense of a Buddhist uh, uh, process, but also a Hegelian one, a being is becoming. And, um, and then it has a third kind of echo, which is why I thought that Ambedkar needs to be humanized and removed from the pedestal, which is a lot of the Marathi you know, uh, uh, literature, was precisely because an exemplar in time, you know, I, I, Ananya mentioned I have students all over the world. Um, and since I travel from place to place, I keep in touch with them through WhatsApp and email and, and things like this. And over the last five years, I've noticed a change in the demeanor of these students all over, from all over. And over the last five years, it has become more and more hopeless. Like, what do I do? There are no jobs. I'm afraid, you know, oh, sir, yesterday I gave a talk. It was wonderful, but I thought I was going to be in jail the next day, you know, as a, co a consequence of it, which is a real thing now. So I'm getting so many of these messages, and I have been over the last five years, and I've realized the times are dark. But the times that Ambedkar lived in, the resources at his disposal, the material conditions and constraints, social opprobrium, the possibility of jail. You know, he was going to lose his bar uh, uh, law degree for, as a result of the Mahat Satyagraha. So all the conditions facing him, the turn of the century, are no jollier than those that face us. They're equally bleak, if not more bleak. And his personal situation is probably more constrained, was probably more constrained, more limited than even my contemporary students who complain about having no money and, and, and things like that. And I realized that a God cannot be an exemplar. A God cannot be a beacon, you know, a path to follow and to, to imitate, to, to understand. As Ambedkar himself says, that's a part of biography. You take from that person what you can and you assimilate it into you. But you can't do that with a God. A God can leap from... India to Lanka, right? You can't, but a man cannot. And so Ambedkar needs to be taken down off of a pedestal, if only to serve as an exemplar in a time that is very dark, ours, that can learn from a man who was in a very dark time and through the trials and the tribulations, ultimately triumph. So his being a man is extremely important for that. Um, it has angered many people in Maharashtra that even the very picture that I use, this passport picture from 1932, I use it because no one has ever seen it before. I found it in an archive. I also use it because in Amitka's own hand, it gives his date of birth as 1892, which is just very funny because I found now 1891, 1892, 1893 in Amitka's own hand, you know, part of the mystery of when was he born and all of this. But I use it also because it shows him as a man. How do you look when you're at a passport office? Miserable. But not the blue suit and the pink uh, skin and the red lips, right? All of that Ic iconography. I don't want that iconography, but that annoyed people. Why are you using that photo? He doesn't look glamorous and so on. But he needs to be a man for the function of what I'm trying to achieve, which is a kind of resource for all of my students who are in the deepest pits of despair today that watch this man's life, watch how he achieved what he achieved and take some, you know, solace in it, some inspiration. So Hilal, a lot of how myself comes in is that I ensure that 
his triumphs and how he negotiated them. As I have been saying in many talks, what I'm trying to do is go from how, as unlikely as it is statistically, Bhiva Ambedavikar became Bhimrao Ambedkar and then became Ambedkar Bharat Law and then became Dr. Ambedkar and then became Baba Sahib. And every one of those stages or moments in the Hegelian sense was so unlikely. Every one of them, every one of them had viable alternatives. You know, even Bhiva Ambedavikar to Bhimrao Ambedkar. Ambedkar, when his father remarried and his stepmother started wearing his mother's jewelry, he was off to Bombay to get work as a mill worker in the textile mills in Bombay. And that's not just some fanciful idea. His brother had already done it. In fact, 90% of Dalits were doing precisely that, leaving these places and going to work as labor in the mills. So had he made that choice, which was a real choice of which there was a precedent, he would not have even gone from Biva to Bhimra, you know. So imagine going from Biva to Babasa. So I wanted to suture this together, knowing the end point, but also with a, a goal. And so there myself comes in very much because there are probably certain failures or certain fruitless, you know, moves and maneuvers that that I choose to, I may have discovered that I choose, no, that's not going to work in the narrative. Um, but I feel very uncomfortable saying that, right? Because one wants a kind of objectivity, especially with the fixation on facts. Um, but it's, it's inevitable what, what you say. Um, I think I, I addressed a little bit of both. So maybe I have to say, Ananya, you thought I'm here for a few more days. I'm, my flight to Cambodia is tonight. Um, sure. and, and I'm leaving uh, for the airport from here. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> so uh okay so uh, if 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 you yeah there's more time the, there, there's not uh, yeah yeah okay <laughs> that's good from our perspective okay, <laughs> okay but you have yes yes you know, there's yeah. there's six questions in the six. chat box okay so i i'll just i'll give you the gist of them ah. instead of the long version one person actually just asked if you could explain how we arrive at the name ambedkar was it his oh. teacher's name? What was yeah. his village name? What was his father's name, et yeah. cetera? So you, if you can just quickly tell us that. Um, another person wants to know, maybe it's the same person asking two questions. Um, okay, so there's all these problems with uh, with Kiev and, and Kermore and, and various other biographers, and you're still writing your book. So if I want to read something now, can you recommend one other biography? biographical source that that one can read which is which is in your view is somewhat more reliable okay um then there's a, a question which i think maybe you can perhaps bracket because it's about a much later stage in his life which is not covered in this book which is how did he come to be the chairman of the drafting committee but i think that you know it's you can you don't need to go there if you you know if you don't have time um and then there's uh, two questions which are slightly hard to understand but i think one of them uh is about in the intention to convey something and the perspective of the the reader so the intention to convey something on the part of the biographer or the author and how that is going to impact the impression formed on the on the reader eventually. Um, and do you think also that Baba Sahib himself had a certain intended impression that he wanted to convey, a story he wanted to tell, a, a persona he wanted to present to the public and to leave for posterity? And how do we recapture that? Um, I may be reading too much into the question, but it's just right. <laughs> and, and the last thing is uh, about, uh, I think this must be from a student of literature because she asks, uh, the ontology, she says, of history and of fiction, these are two different ontologies. Um, that of history has to do with understanding and explanation, and that of fiction has to do with what is real and what is apparent. Now, I, you know, I, I, I'm not vouching for any of this, but um, how do you negotiate these 
In other words, are you coming at this uh, as though you were writing a novel or are you coming at this as though you were writing a history? Um, I think it boils down to that. Um, that's just my redaction of the, of the questions. Thank you. Uh, these are amazing questions. Uh, I don't know if it's the interpreter of the questions or the questions them, themselves. Um, so the name Ambedkar, it's interesting how often this issue comes up, especially in Maharashtra. I would wager it was a Maharashtrian who asked the question, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, let's see. But uh, so as the person who asked the question obviously knows, there's a great deal, not only of, um, of uh, curiosity about it, but there's a you know, political orientation about it. Yakan, the Tamil writer, has written a book, um, which my Tamil friends have translated for me as um, getting rid of the stain of the name. So, you know, just being named by a Brahmin is a stain in itself. And then Yakan's uh, work is systematically showing some fundamental problems with the received uh, tradition. The one I find most problematic is the, the fact that Ambedkar, the, the very source used to prove that Ambedkar got the name at Satara School is the registration at Satara School. So if he had been a student there and received that name, then why did he register under that name? So that's an anachronism, right? You remember the, the ledger? He's, yeah, he's registered. And, and, uh, and then after, I, presumably after registering, you have your classes with a teacher who might have given you a name. But the registration, which is used to say he was called Ambitka by et cetera, already calls him on it. So it's not uh, unproblematic. It does get prob I, I have a lot of, I have been to the school. Maybe you have as well. I know 20 people who have been to the school, including people with a lot of access like Professor Torat and so on. And none of them managed, none of us managed to find what has recently been found by, uh, you know, a, a, a I don't want to name names actually, but by someone who's part of the Ambedkar family stating that it's conclusive evidence that his brother was also registered under that name. Now his brother, you know, before he was taken out of school um, because they, his father couldn't afford the tuition fees, uh, also studied at Satara and Elphinstone with Ambedkar, but he had to join the laboring life like everybody else. And that um, this uh, particular person has discovered that um, that he also registered under the name Ambedkar, which means that it's the story is completely fabricated. The only problem is that so many of us have been there before. Why didn't we find this record that this particular person found? So I I am I'm sus I'm not suspicious. Yeah, I am suspicious about that discovery. I write in the biography, the in the footnotes, oh, the stat the state of the art what we now know. But I do tend to believe that it is likely that the story, the received story is, is untrue. At the same time, the primary source for the story is Ambedkar himself. But as I have mentioned, Ambedkar is not always reliable on the history of Ambedkar. Uh, what is a reliable biography? Well, there are actually very, very many if you turn to the evolution of his public life. So Eleanor Elliot is brilliant. You know, there's, there's, the, uh, even, even Jeffalo, I say, I say that so reluctantly. He's a friend, but I mean, I have a lot of trouble with his, his writings on Ambit. Um, is insightful, you know, uh, on the, how Ambitka came, negotiated the social to the political, um, and became the Ambitka that we know today. Um, but in terms of personal information and interiority and so on, I think that my book is the only one who really, which really captures it reliably. Ashok Gopal's book is in some ways a masterpiece, um, but his reliance or over-reliance on Karmodi without verifying those sources is problematic uh, for me. Also problematic is of course how we're all trying to liberate Ambedkar from the constant connection in the Savarna discourses of Gandhi and Ambedkar. 
And Ashok Gopal's book, I thought, was you know finally going to give us an Ambedkar. But the introduction is all about Gandhi and Ambedkar. And I found that very kind of disappointing um, and not a good move. I mean, if you're a Tamil Brahmin writer of Ambedkar's biography, you have to be careful. You know, I have to be careful uh, as a Samana biographer. And I, the last thing I would do is start my biography with Gandhi, 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 because we all know how that ended up um, for uh, what's Arundhati Roy. So I found that really strange. But his, but it's an insightful biography. But I don't rely on it for the personal details. But there are very, many, very many. I, the last thing I want to be suggesting is that they're all bad, and I've done this. Nothing of the sort. I'm doing a very different thing. Um, uh, but there's, you know, Gail Omvedt is good, Zeliot is good, Jaffalo is good, Gopal is, you know, a masterpiece of its kind. So there are plenty of things to read. I will answer the chairman of the drafting committee thing because I wrote a book on it. My previous one on Bitka's preamble, yeah, it, it documents it and it's probably on some Russian websites you can read for free. So I, I, I outline how Ambedkar got, uh, uh, got uh, to that position. Intention and impact on the reader is very fascinating because, okay, I can't say my intention and the impact. I can't predict that. You know, I, I don't know how it will impact. I have tried to be responsible in what I say so that I can limit the amount of negative impact, but I don't know what the impact will be. But the impact that Ambedkar intended is very fascinatingly captured in his photo, photographs. Ananya has written about this and also pointed out that there's there are kind of different Ambedkars you can see in the photographs. And the clear distinction is between the staged photos, where he knows the photo is being taken, stern, austere, and the candid photos, where he's not, you know, someone just captures him. He's laughing, he's giggling, he's chortling, you know, with S.K. Boli on his lap and so on. He's got this great look on his face. So, so he was projecting something in the staged photos. He was projecting the seriousness, sternness, of his mission and that he was not to be toyed with. Whereas in his candid photos, he's very, very jolly. And that's intriguing that you see this projection by him himself. The last question, maybe the most philosophical about the distinctions between the domains of, or the ontologies of history and literature. Um, it's funny, I have a philosopher, but the two philosophical questions I've been asked, I just, I don't know how to answer them. Um, your summarization, encapsulation of it, were you writing history or literature? I was very much writing history, very, very much, but doing it in a manner that was an approachable narrative because I'm writing it not for Ambedkarites, but for those who, you know, have never stepped into this field, have always felt distant from him. And, uh, and you know, to in an effort to maybe make more Ambedkarites rather than feed the current community some some more stuff. So I, it's very much history, but I try to do it in an approachable way. I hope the narrative was approachable. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. I think, you know, um, for me, the, the relevant points of comparison, more and more, uh, both coming out of Ambedkar's own interest and the time period to which he belonged uh, are Gandhi, the Buddha, maybe Ashoka. And we are well aware of the difficulties of reconstructing any of these lives, um, the degree to which they are subject to myth-making, um, the problematic historicity of all of them, even though Gandhi is, is so near to us uh, in, in, in his historical chronological time. Um, and I think Ambedkar, Ambedkar's own fascination with these characters <laughs> um, is also a kind of clue uh, to how he approaches uh, a life, you know, including maybe the living of his own life and the telling of that life. Um, I don't, I don't know if Pule has quite the, quite the canvas that Ambedkar is after, uh, with his interest in the Buddha and willy nilly his engagement with Gandhi, but, um, you know, that's another kind of reference point. 
But thank you, Akash, for coming here and for talking to us and for taking all our questions. Um, and I just want to say to people who are here that we have just a couple of copies of the book discounted at author's price uh, if you'd like to pick them up now. Uh, otherwise, we'll surely, of course, have it uh, in our library uh, soon enough. Thanks, Akash, and, and safe travels. Thank you so much. With the book and otherwise.